Yes. Thank you for reminding of this. Uh, she actually put a thumbs up. So I think that she'll have it going. All right. So Dr. Sarwak, do you have the recording starting? Yes, I do, Dr. Elamine. Thank you, I just wanted to make sure. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody to the sixth annual Alonzo Kinney Brew Lecture and Forum. Hopefully next year we will have the opportunity to be able to be in person. Uh, the Alonzo Homer Kinney Brew MD Forum on Health Inequities and Disparities is an annual discussion of health disparities and other factors that impact population health. It commemorates the life of a groundbreaking Central Illinois physician. In the last six years, we have explored the complexity of what is needed to truly have equitable health care. We have talked about trust, truth, having authentic dialogues, having accountability, and really looking for what the meaningful action is going to be to save lives. Dr. Kenny Brew was a native of Warriors Point, Alabama. He was the first African-American physician in the United States to build and operate a surgical hospital, New Home Sanitarium in Jacksonville, Illinois. And this was established in 1909. At its peak in the 1920s, the new home had 67 rooms, three laboratories, three surgeons, and eight associated physicians. It served patients from 20 states and Canada. Dr. Kenny Booth founded this hospital because he could not received privileges in any area hospitals. He was the son of a former slave. He was an educated um, at oh, Tuskegee so University else right. and was a friend and colleague oh, and personal physician to Booker T. Washington. After relocating to Illinois, he persevered despite repeated roadblocks from the Jim Crow world of the early 20th century. This annual lecture sheds light on the history of health disparities suggesting solutions to the resistant problems that negatively affect the lives of so many in the United States. Everyone has an opportunity to practice inclusive excellence. Uh, Our right. vision for an equitable future is clear. We must have unwavering oh, commitment to equity. Oh. So the SIU School of Medicine, the Hospital Sisters Health System, Memorial Health have come together to develop further collaborations and innovation to address health inequities. This Kenny Brew lecture has really been an opportunity for us Which the to doctor, illuminate uh, that, uh, some of the blind spots. Speaking, she's. Okay, is everybody muted? Oops. <laughs> All right. So one of the things that we're trying to do at the Kenny Brew is to give our lecturers and individuals that are supporting our forms an opportunity to really illuminate some of the blind spots that we have. So what we're looking for um, is what our speaker talks about is radical accountability. We want everybody to feel a sense of accountability for helping us to move the needle around health equity. So at this time, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Cruz, who is the SIU School of Medicine Dean. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Elamine. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here tonight and welcome to all of you, all 145 of you. That's a big attendance. Uh, thank, thank you all for coming. And my great thanks tonight to the Kennebrew family, to Ms. Charlotte Johnson, Dr. Kennebrew's daughter for the endowment and to Memorial Health System, to HSHS St. John's, to the School of Medicine Foundation <laughs> for making this event possible and for allowing us to honor Dr. Kennebrew and to celebrate his life, his courage, and his spirit. Uh, and a special welcome to uh, all of our uh, learners, our students, resident physicians, fellows, and a spe another special welcome to the P4 students. Thank you for coming and learning. The visiting professors that have graced the stage for the Canterbury Lecture and the Forum have become an essential part of our organization. Uh, they all bring new information, they bring discussion, frank and honest dialogue, they bring inspiration to us all. This event has played a major role in the transformation of SIU medicine 
as we become an anti-racist organization. Now, this all started six years ago. Uh, the Kettlebell Forum and Lecture began at that time. The School of Medicine established a new Associate Dean position, the first Associate Dean for Diversity and Inclusion, Dr. Wes McNeese. Upon Dr. McNeese's retirement, Dr. Wendy Alamin became the Associate Dean for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. And three years ago, the School of Medicine committed to become an anti-racist organization. So our students organized. The Marginalized Student Network helped us focus on our efforts. We established an anti-racism task force and four anti-racism subcommittees to examine all that we are as an organization. So subcommittees for metrics and benchmarks, two for training, three policies and procedures for organizational analysis. The Kennebrew visiting professors have been remarkable consultants and colleagues through all of these initial steps. And the culture has started to change. We collectively have a greater awareness, a greater understanding of the macro issues, at least. And we have started to develop a common vocabulary. Our, our employee engagement survey actually shows us that that's true. And now there are many things that we need to unlearn, and there are many new things for which we now have, as Dr. Alamine said, radical accountability or radical responsibility. Uh, actually, I've learned a lot the past couple of days from Dr. Sunny Nakai and from Dr. Carrie Lockhart, and you'll hear more from, from them later in this whole progression. So we'll learn, unlearn a lot, a lot tonight, and we'll learn a lot tonight, and thanks again for, for being here. And now I'd like to introduce Hal Smith, Executive Director of Development for the School of Medicine Foundation. Hal? Thank you, Dr. Cruz. I appreciate the, uh, your introduction and your comments about the, the institution. The foundation, as all of you know, it, our, our responsibility is to follow the same mission that the School of Medicine has. We just have an, a, one additional step. We have to reach out for partnerships to raise funds to support these efforts to accelerate the, the purposes uh, set forth by the Dean at the School of Medicine. So we completely agree with all that they agree with, that all the mission statements they've made, especially about equity and justice and healthcare and all those things, equity and healthcare, everything. And so the foundation was fortunate to find our hospital partners as we always do, Memorial Health uh, and, and the HSHS, Hospital Sisters Health System, became our partners to fund this originally with the School of Medicine. We're honored and humbled to actually be continue to be a part of that. So we thank you all for your support and for being here tonight. Um, one of the things that we do as a foundation is also reach out to people who have, people and in institutions who have value systems and see if they'd like to help us support. So I'd like to just bring to your attention a couple of funds that would support the work of Dr. Wendy Elamine here at the foundation in case you'd like to look at those for, for support in the future. We thank that. Go to forwardfunder.siumed.edu, and I'll put that in the chat for you so you can find it. But there are three different funds that are highlighted on that page. One, the Kenny Brew Lectureship. Second is Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, of course. And then the Med Prep Program, the undergraduate program at SIU that helps uh, underserved populations prepare themselves for advanced degrees in medicine. So including medical school. So those are the funds I'd ask you to reach out to if you're interested in supporting us. And for those who've already supported us, we're extremely grateful, Charlotte Johnson and her family, for, for bringing uh, to our attention the, this great and amazing story of courage and determination over injustice. So thank you all for being here. It's a pleasure and an honor to be with you. And uh, thank you. Enjoy the rest of the evening. Dr. Nkai's comments uh, also will be exciting for all of us. So thank you. And my job now is to introduce uh, a new face to this, uh, this lectureship, a person who we had dinner with last night, but he's been with us eight and a half or nine months. He came last summer to the, health, uh, the Hospital Sisters Health System uh, from Charleston, South Carolina, originally a Citadel graduate, and incredibly uh, like the sisters themselves who run that hospital and that hospital system with devotion uh, to equity for all, and especially in healthcare. He, is the, he embodies all of that. When you meet him, you know what a kind person he is and how great he is and how supportive he is of these, these great causes. So it's my pleasure to introduce the new president and CEO of HSHS, the system in Illinois, 10 hospitals, uh, Damon 
boat ride. It's great to have you, Damon. Thank you. And welcome to this lectureship. Thank you, Hal. And I really do appreciate such a gracious and hospitable introduction. I'm very excited to be here with all of you, even though I am new to the area, uh, meeting uh, people and individuals like Hal and some others that I'm going to introduce after me um, makes me feel like I'm at home. So let me just say this, uh, HSHS, uh, Hospital Sisters Health System and St. John's Hospital, which is in Springfield in particular, we are honored and privileged to join SIU School of Medicine, as well as Memorial Health System and particularly Springfield uh, Memorial Hospital for the sixth annual Dr. Alonzo Kinney Brew Lecture and Forum. We launched this partnership six years ago, I found out, in an effort to have the opportunity to bring critical and necessary conversations around race and racism to the forefront. And although I'm new to this group, let me just say this. I am a proponent of telling the whole history. I love history, as long as it's not just his story. And so to that end, on March 25th, 1966, which is almost 50 years ago to the day in Chicago at a press conference, before his speech at the second convention of the Medical Committee for Human Rights, it was Martin Luther King Jr. who said, and I quote, we are concerned about the constant use of federal funds to support this most notorious expression of segregation. Of all the forms of inequality, injustice in health is the most shocking and the most inhuman because it often results in physical death. Dr. Kenny Brew, well ahead of his time, boldly addressed racial disparities and inequities in healthcare and left a legacy that calls us to action today, just like it did Martin Luther King 50 years ago. St. John's Hospital mission is to reveal and embody Christ's healing love for all people through our care. Just as Dr. Kinney Brew tire tirelessly pursued equitable health care for all, our mission calls us to join others to improve health and health access. Over the next couple of days, we're honoring the work of Dr. Kinney Brew and what he did and the legacy that he left us by joining together to forge a new legacy built on trust, action, accountability, and health care. Now, it's my distinct pleasure to now invite Ed Curtis, President and CEO of Memorial Health, to provide some remarks. And although it's early in our relationship together, I too find uh, both Ed um, as well as the leadership uh, within SIU, Dr. Jerry Cruz, uh, Dr. El Amin, and all the other individuals that I've met as true partners and ally, allies in this work. So. Ed, I welcome you to make some comments to this group as well, and nice to see you. Good evening, everyone, and Damon, thank you for that kind introduction, and I'll tell you, I'm excited for all of you to get to know Damon Boatwright and have an opportunity to work with him, because what a blessing he is to uh, be the new leader at HSHS, and I'm just so excited he's here. Well, let's talk a little bit about tonight and what an honor it is to be invited to this event and uh, Dr. Alamine gave us a nice little history of uh, Dr. Kenny Brew, but remember, sadly racism and ignorance are obstacles and were obstacles to his talented career. And guess what? Springfield Memorial was one of those hospitals that turned him away. That's why he moved to Jacksonville and set up his own new home sanitarium at the turn of the last century. Um, but today, I wish I could say our society has eradicated those attitudes of ignorance and racism. Unfortunately, we know that's just not true. We still have work to do. We know that decades of inequities have created conditions where healthcare is still not fully inclusive and accessible to all. And Memorial Health is absolutely committed to working with the school, Memorial, and all of you to make a difference. The concept of being an ally, what we're gonna talk about tonight, being able to speak up and help combat and correct injustice and mistreatment is an important skill for us all to learn and cultivate. And that's why I'm excited to be here tonight. And I know Dr. Nakai will bring us valuable insights this evening and, and the work with her and Dr. Lockhart tomorrow. Um, I'm so pleased that they're both here. So I wanna thank the medical school 
I want to thank all of you that have played a part in organizing this event. And a special thanks to the Kinnebrew descendants that are here tonight to participate with us. And wow, what an attendance we have here tonight. So let's learn and grow together. With that, I'd like to introduce one of my colleagues at Memorial, Valeria Cueto, joined us this last year in the summer. And Valeria is Vice President of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. And uh, I'm excited that she's here tonight to uh, introduce some uh, special awards. Good evening, Valeria. Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Curtis. And I've got to say, I'm pretty excited to be um, honored with bestowing the awards today. The Dr. Kennebrew Equity Award is an acknowledgement bestowed upon an individual and or organizations, and today there'll be one individual and an organization actively promoting inclusive excellence, excellence that contributes to and enhances the environment of Springfield through sustained commitment to improving opportunities for the diverse communities that we serve. Mr. Robert Blackwell has been a champion for racial equity for decades. He is recently retired from the state um, after having served for 25 years with the Illinois Department of Children and Family Services. In 2012, he was appointed chief of the Office of Racial Equity Practice, where he led the department's efforts to address and eliminate racial disparities and unwanted disproportionality in the Illinois child welfare system. He holds a master's degree in social work from the University of Illinois. And from 1977 through 1984, he worked as a counselor, job developer, and a program director for the Springfield Urban League in Springfield. In 1984, he joined the Department of Child and Family Services, where he served in a variety of executive level management positions and has held a number of other roles, bringing inclusivity and has held and a number of other roles bringing inclusivity and I think something funky happened. I think something funky happened. Am I echoing? Am I echoing? Yes. Yes. Somebody hit share their screen. They need to unshare. Yep, I think that's what it is. Somebody hit share their screen. They need to unshare. It says I'm yeah. viewing, viewing Edith Harris's screen. Edie, I think you're helps. sharing the screen inadvertently. You need to unshare. You're sharing it inadvertently. Viewing Edith Harris's screen. I think we might be up and running again. Okay. Yes, we're able to continue. Perfect. So I was saying that Mr. Blackwell has held a number of other roles and a consistent in, from what I can tell, his entire life has been bringing inclusivity and an anti-racist praxis in all of the spaces he inhabits. Though retired, he continues to be active in the community through service as a member of the Springfield Dominican anti-racism team and if you need any evidence of the powerful impact he has there, you just look at the screen and see the number of Dominican sisters that have joined to recognize him today. I also wanna add that that's where I got to meet Mr. Blackwell and I consider myself really lucky um, in that respect. He is a member of the University of Illinois uh, Champaign-Urbana School of Social Works Community Engagement Advisory Board a board trustee of Lutheran Child and Family Services of Illinois, chairs the Community Advisory Group, Department of Internal Medicine, SIU School of Medicine, and is president of the Scarsboro Homeowners Association, and workshop leader, works with Junior Frontiers International, and is a member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity and Mu Delta Lambda chapter in Springfield. So retired, but not that retired. He and his wife, Carolyn, um, a retired educator and member of Delta Sigma Theta sorority, 
have been married for 49 years and have three daughters. Tracy Mars, Yale Law Professor, Nicole Florence, um, a colleague of ours at Memorial, a physician with Memorial Wellness Center, and Deanna Blackwell, um, an education, culture, and society for Peace Corps coordinator. And I've talked to him before about how amazing these three women are and looking for all of the tips that he has for raising these kind of women who, in their own right, bring equity and inclusion in all of the spaces that they work in. Bob has been a mentor to many, um, myself included, and I am just thrilled to be able to honor him today with the Kennebrew Equity Award. So I'd like to invite him to share a few words. Thank you, Valeria. As I uh, manage the screen, it's asking me to unmute myself, and I just did. So hopefully, all the so. And I'd also like to say thanks to the SIU School of Medicine, its foundation, HSHS St. John's Hospital, and Memorial Health. I am deeply appreciative of receiving this award at such an event as the sixth annual Dr. Kennebrew Lecture. I am particularly excited and give a special greeting to Mrs. Johnson, the daughter of Dr. Kennebrew. This truly is a great honor for me as it truly blesses my work in this field and offers a unique opportunity for me to acknowledge the wellsprings from whence my strength and resolve originate. I speak of my beautiful and inspirational wife, Carolyn, and our equally beautiful and inspirational daughters, Tracy, Nicole, and Deanna. We are proud that not only have they sacrificed on my journey, but that in their respective practices are equally committed to racial equity, justice, and peace, and are neither confused nor complicit with the lie. My reference is to the American writer and activist James Baldwin, who frames the American condition as coherent around a set of practices that taken together operate on the belief that in America, white lives have always mattered more than the lives of others, that people of color are inherently inferior to white people. Thus, the lie. Dr. Eddie Glau Jr. in his book, Begin Again, lays this issue out convincingly and compels us to call forth a new America where liberty and justice is for all. Carolyn has rightly beseeched me to brevity this evening, reminding me that we have a speaker schedule and I am not that speaker. But I must share that in briefing on the illustrious life of Dr. Kennebrew, I was surprised and utterly delighted that though we never had occasion to meet, we both shared a relationship with his wife, Miss Jessie Mae Schultz Kennebrew Finley. For years after moving to Springfield in the 70s, Carolyn and I sat every Sunday morning with Mrs. Finley and her then husband, Theo Finley, in Sunday school class at Zion Missionary Baptist Church here in Springfield. They both were incredibly lovely, talented, proud, spiritual individuals, and among our many activist role models. Mrs. Finley also sang in the church choir, and Mr. Finley would grace us on occasion with a bottle of his homemade wine. Dr. Kennebrew's genius also included an impeccable choice in mates in Jesse Mae Finley. I think that I probably have reveled enough in this moment, a glorious moment 
it is for me. I close by offering that the work of equity, justice, and resistance to racism sets firmly on the legacy of men and women like Dr. Kennebrew, Jesse May, Rosa, Harriet, Martin, Malcolm, Thurgood, Barack, and countless others. In order to realize the promise of peace, equity, and justice, we must imbue their practice in our personal lives and anti-racist policies and practices of all of our institutions. And with respect to those who came before us, who endure the harsh realities of racism, while vigilantly holding America to its constitution and rule of law. We too must pour into the incredible activism of our youth of color and their white allies to get us all to a place of peace and love as promised to us by God. Thank you again for this award and know that it will be cherished and may peace be unto all. Thank you, Mr. Blackwell. Ooh, you can throw up some clapping, some hearts. It's, hard. it's a little funky in a, in a virtual world, but we heard your words. Thank you for that. So now I get to introduce an organization that is also doing tremendous work in this space of anti-racism, equity, and inclusion. The Student National Medical Association, SNM, SNMA, is a student organization of the National Medical Association, which was a group founded in 1895 when physicians of color were barred from joining organized medical groups. Part of the mission of SIU's SNMA chapter is to be committed to the promotion and active improvement of medical education, to involve its members in the social, moral, and ethical obligations of the profession of medicine, to assist in the improvement and understanding of world health problems, to contribute to the welfare of all members, including medical students, interns, residents, and faculty members. The group really sees itself as a group of social justice warriors that are dedicating their time and attention to improving both the SIU community and minoritized community members in Springfield. Throughout the past year, the group has been com committed to serving the surrounding community and to developing as young professionals. Some of the initiatives that they have worked on include specialty talks, where they expose minority students to panel discussions with a variety of medical specialties. They have volunteered with the Physician Pipeline Preparatory Program, P4, and have volunteered with various community service partners. Some of their new community service initiatives for this year included some health screenings at the local Juneteenth celebration and the Illinois State Fair and representing SIU School of Medicine at a local HBCU college fair. A transformative moment of their year was expanding community service with local groups, um, which included conducting free back to school and well child physicals with the local NAACP chapter. They have collaborated with many groups to address the social determinants of health, among them the Springfield Immigrant Advocacy Network, Helping Hands, and in addition to doing all of that external work, they also looked inward and found inequities and addressed them in-house. So one of those things that they worked on was addressing food insecurity experienced by students. Through their work, now there is a way for students who are experiencing food insecurity to come um, anonymously to get healthy foods so that they, they don't go hungry during difficult times. They have helped with anti-bias curriculum, um, both the written and unwritten medical curriculum. And in general, as a group has really strived to go beyond the call of duty to serve as a beacon 
for the future of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Amazing work from a group of students that I imagine are doing all sorts of learning in addition to that work that they're doing. And so it is my distinct honor to call the co-presidents, Catherine Green and Kamaria Coleman to accept the award on behalf of SNM SNMA. Good evening, everyone. My name is Catherine Green. Uh, wow, what an honor. <laughs> Even behind a computer screen is still a little daunting speaking in front of so many people, but thank you um, to just to start off. So over the past few years, I'm sure we can all imagine that we've experienced personal in addition to um, global, global devastation. Yet even through these uncertain times, our communities, our families, and SNMA, our organization continues to stand strong. We have made it our goal and our mission to continue to propel forward excellence in everything that we do. So in light of that, we would like to say thank you to the nominating committee, to our advisors, Dr. Wendy wills Elamine, Leslie Barfield, and Melissa Cruz, as well as to the entire Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Without your unwavering support, we would not be able to be where we are and to do what we do and to continue to propel forward the future that we have. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Kamaria Coleman. I'm a third year medical student and one of the other co-presidents. Um, first, I would just like to start by acknowledging my lovely parents, my mother and father, friends, and my support system for being here today. Echoing what Catherine said, thank you to our advisors, Dr. Wendy Elamine, Leslie Barfield, because without their support, literally, <laughs> we could not do the work that we do. They support us so much. And as it already has been stated, we thank you for this tremendous honor. I'd like to tell you guys a little bit more about the history of SNMA. SNMA founded in 1964. And since that time, it has literally been crucial to the development of professional students in many different areas, medical students, pre-medical students, and even high school students. It is a vast organization with the national program. They have conferences all over. Pretty much any minority physician you ask, if they are, know about the SNMA and NMA, they will. So it has been more than a pipeline for um, creating minority physicians. Um, and just to highlight our work with the NAACP and SIU Family Medicine, we were able to provide back to school physicals for well over 100 children. They had um, school giveaways, free haircuts, we did screening for lead poisoning. We um, were just able to serve so many people of different socioeconomic classes, races, abilities, disabilities, you name it. So that truly was a great, awesome time for us to really be in the community. Um, as we go forward, we just wanna leave you guys with saying that we will continue to serve and fight for equity and justice for all people in Springfield and beyond. Thank you. Okay, well, thanks uh, so very much for that. And uh, now it's uh, my great honor to introduce our speaker tonight, uh, Dr. Sunny Nakai. Oops, uh, I'm having some trouble here. Okay, over the past few days, I, I've had the honor to get to know Dr. Nakai. Uh, she certainly has a wealth of experience in a broad spectrum of fields and interests related to equity, to student affairs, and to academic life. She brings an astounding level of expertise and energy to each of these areas, and I've marveled at the way that she synthesizes information and communicates it in a clear and very understandable way. And she is a master of the acronym, and that's a very useful uh, marketing and communication tool for sure. Dr. Nakai is uh, currently the Senior Associate Dean for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion and Partnerships at California University of Science and Medicine where she's also Associate Professor of Medical Education. She has had appointments in student affairs and other academic positions at University of California, Riverside, the Loyola University of Chicago Stritch School of Medicine, the Feinberg School of Medicine at Northwestern, and at the University of Utah. She holds a master's degree in social work from the U of U and a PhD in higher education from Loyola University, Chicago. She's uh, the faculty lead for the Association of American Medical Colleges group 
on student affairs, professional development initi initiative, and equity matters. So this week, Dr. Nakai has led discussions about unlearning and radical responsibility and other things. And I've learned a lot and we will learn a lot more tonight. So Dr. Sunny Nakai. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here with everyone and congratulations again to the award winners. Um, this work is deeply important and I hope after my remarks today it'll be even more apparent um, how important and, and far reaching um, the work of good people and, and the kindness and commitment of, of good people really is. So let me go ahead and share my screen. I hope that I can um, figure this out. Let's see. Okay. Okay, so hopefully everyone can see my screen. So I wanna start, um, I'm gonna share a lot of stories with you today as we talk about allyship and ally skills. And I'm gonna start with a, with a personal story. There was a young Japanese boy born in Northern California in 1918. He was the eldest son in an immigrant family that came to America to settle the West. At the age of 13 or thereabouts, his father sent him on a delivery 500 miles north to Caldwell, Idaho. So farm kids get to drive whenever they want, in case you weren't aware of that fun fact. <laughs> uh, he drove his flatbed Ford alone for the trip, and after making the delivery, he was heading back to the main road and had to pass through the center of town. As he proceeded through the intersection, another driver ran a stop sign and crashed into him. Although he wasn't badly hurt, he was very afraid. He was an immigrant teen in a town that did not seem friendly or welcoming. He was Japanese, an immigrant farmer in an Idaho farming town where anti-immigrant sentiments were prevalent. The woman who caused the crash accused the boy and told the police it was his fault. A crowd gathered to watch the scene. The boy was terrified and tried to explain, but no one would believe him. He was cuffed and the officer led him to the open door of a police car. In that moment, the boy wondered if he was ever going to see his family again. He had heard stories of awful things that happened to immigrants when they ventured where they weren't welcome. In that moment, he was powerless. Just as he was about to be shut in the car, the mayor of the town came onto the scene. He spoke firmly to the police officer. I was sitting in that cafe across the street in the window and I saw the entire thing. This boy is innocent. The crash was the fault of the other driver who ran the stop sign, Release the boy and let him go on his way. And I will see to it that he is paid for the damages to his truck as well. The crowd that had gathered seemed a little restless and some bystanders protested. The mayor continued speaking firmly to the crowd. This boy is allowed to leave. Should anyone wish to prosecute him or detain him, they should contact me and I will stand in his place. We can only imagine the relief the boy felt as he began his long journey home. He later wrote in his memoirs that the mayor probably saved his life that day. So why am I starting with this story? Well, today we're gonna to talk about the power of allies and I'm standing here or sitting here on Zoom with you right now because of that mayor from Caldwell, Idaho, because the boy in the story was my grandfather and he was able to return home safely. My presence today and our time today tells you that the actions of one person can make a difference and can reach across difference for a better world. So our campus and our university is more than a school, it's a community. So what does it mean to be inclusive in our campus? What does it mean to care for each other? How do we get there? How do we get to a place of anti-racism? And what does it mean to stand in place for someone? So this is a picture of my, my grandfather. He passed away in 2016 and I will be sharing more stories um, of, his, of his life. So this talk is called Becoming an Ally. Emphasis on the word becoming, because this is really a process that's truly never done. It is a constant revisiting of things about ourselves and getting to know. It's a constant process of listening. And one of the things that I think is the most challenging about it is that there are really no arrivals, just this journey of continually becoming and learning. So today we're gonna to talk about what allyship means 
and we're going to talk about how identity shapes our experiences. I want to emphasize the importance of allies in correcting injustice and mistreatment, and you will hear stories from my family um, on that point. We are going to actually talk about ally skills and explore some of them, and then hopefully make some commitments to continued development and implementation of these skills. So before we get started, I wanna take a moment to do a reflection. And I often do this um, when we do anti-racism work because I think it's important for us to acknowledge the spectrum of experiences that inform our presence here today. So imagine if racism were a bonfire, take a moment to reflect on your place in your proximity to racism over the course of your life, right? Some people have been burned by it. Some people have to stand way too close to the heat all the time. Some people get to admire it from afar. Some people get to see the smoke from the hills and some people may not even know that the fire is burning. So I ask you to do this um, Slido. There's a couple of Slidos in the presentation so I can just make sure that y'all are still awake. Um, I want you to take a minute and reflect on how proximal you've um, you've been to racism in your life. So you can scan this QR code with your phone and it will take you right into the poll. It's all anonymous. We don't store the information. It's really kind of just like a show of hands if we were all in the room. Um, or you can enter um, the, the code ally at slido.com um, by just opening another tab if you're watching this on a computer or a tablet. Uh, and then in the corner, this upper right hand corner, it shows us how many people um, how many people have, have joined the poll. So I'll let a few more people um, join the poll and respond. And again, it's anonymous, we don't save it. And this is just for us to think about and reflect on the spectrum of our experiences that have led us to this work, right? Not really having a frame of reference, knowing it exists, but not really feeling impacted, witnessing it, but not feeling directly impacted, experiencing it a little, experiencing it a lot, or really having your life um, being shaped by racism. Okay. So this is who is in the room today. Folks whose lives have been and are currently shaped by racism. Folks who have witnessed it and supported, um, but did not really feel directly impacted. And then folks experiencing it regularly. Some people have not felt that it impacted them. People have experienced it a few times. Um, and I just ask for us to hold that and think about what this means for our different perspectives. And we'll talk a little bit more about that um, as we move forward. And um, the Slido with the following slides with Slido will come up and you'll still be able to scan them and join. So don't worry if you um, have, have not joined yet or if you're driving and, and listening and haven't had a chance to do it. So thank you for participating and offering um, that reflection for us. So let's just do a, a little bit of um, definitions. Diversity in its simplest form to me is, is a resource, it's human capital. It's the ways that we're different from each other based on our backgrounds and our characteristics, our beliefs, our experiences, it can also be demographic differences around um, race or religion or gender identity or sexual identity, um, cognitive differences as well in terms of our, you know, maybe people are engineers or chefs and have different talents and skills. And this is really all the distinct ways that we are different from each other that really amount to resources. We know that diversity is important and we unlock that power of diversity through um, equity and inclusion. So if you have not heard this before, I recommend checking out uh, Dr. Kamara Jones's um, materials on equity. And it, it really is a distinction between everyone getting the same thing and everyone getting what they need to reach their full potential. So if we're using an equality lens, we're gonna say that everyone on this Zoom call gets a pair of shoes. I wear an eight women's wide, so that's what everyone gets. And if you don't wear that size, um, then no special treatment for you, too bad. You don't get something different. Everyone gets the same thing, right? So we get um, equity and equality very confused. Um, and equity is that individuals have the resources to meet their needs and achieve their potential um, according to need and task. So if you're going hiking, you get hiking boots. And if you wear a size 10, you get a size 10. If you need wide, you get wide. If you need narrow, you get narrow, right? So we often confuse equity and equality when we're doing justice work. Um, by thinking that giving people the things that they need that are different from what others need um, is, is being unfair, but in fact, it is being 
equitable. So systems that do not disenfranchise others by design are considered equitable systems. So what's inclusion? Inclusion is fitting in without extra effort, being able to bring your full self, um, a deep sense of belonging. And my colleague, Aaron Reeves um, at Nexions in Chicago says, the opposite of inclusion is not exclusion. The opposite of inclusion is incomplete. So we are missing things. We have not a full array of tools and resources or cards or things that we need to do our task if we are not being inclusive. The opposite of inclusion is incomplete. So inclusive excellence really is about unlocking our full individual and collective potential as a community. So when we think about our campus spaces and places, um, I walked around your campus during my time and through some hallways where I, did, I saw pictures of a lot of people who didn't look like me. And I don't think that folks who have that, that see people who look like them, maybe even recognize or notice the things that are on the walls that aren't very affirming and that don't um, recognize the presence of many members of our community based on those images, right? So who gets to feel that they fit in from day one? Who gets to see their identities modeled and reflected on campus and in leadership spaces? Um, this is one of the, the chapels at Northwestern that I never really thought much, much of. And there, there's a gathering room and a, an auditorium in this area until students who are not of Christian faith mentioned that it made them feel much different, right? Than, than students who just didn't think anything of it and thought that it was just sort of part of the architecture. So let's talk about frames of reference for a minute and reflect on, um, you know, how did that image make you feel? How did this image make you feel when you see chapels or effigies of um, Christendom? What are the things that come to mind? And this one is just a word cloud and you can put in as many words as you'd like. Um, but what sorts of, of feelings and reactions come to mind um, when you see the picture? Judge conflicted, okay, small, annoyed, love peaceful, anger, uncomfortable, exhausted, I don't relate, humble, um, white religion, different, alienated, brainwashed, poor, I don't see myself, beautiful, lots of people saying peaceful, calm, serenity. So this is the same image. And it's, it's the same building if we all walked in, but it doesn't feel the same to all of us because our lived experiences and our identities inform how this feels to be in this space. This is a really key aspect of ally skills. My reality is not everyone's reality. That's the first hurdle to really overcome in becoming an ally is recognizing that all of these feelings are valid and all of these conclusions are true to the people who walk in the shoes that came into this building that were made to feel this way based on their lived experiences. Um, and this is hard for us sometimes to grasp when someone's view is so different from our own. Um, and that's the first hurdle that we really have to overcome um, as allies. And we'll talk a little bit more about this as we move forward. So again, when it comes to inclusion, we have very different starting points. We have very different ending points based on our journeys and our identities. As institutions, we often um, do not provide equitable resources and then we blame people for the outcomes, right? We bring in two plants, they're amazing. We selected them because they're gorgeous. We don't water one, we put one in the closet, shut the door, and then we go, it was a bad plant. We, it had nothing to do with us, right? So often we're not even able to really see the role that we play as an institution within our policies and procedures that either contribute to culture of equity and inclusion or, or take away from it. I love this graphic because it's an updated version. Um, you've probably seen the, the you know, sort of equity and equality kind of paradigm. And um, then someone put this cynical one in to represent reality um, where some people sort of have, you know, far below the baseline and some people have way more than they need. But I like the one on the far right that really talks about liberation. And you'll notice that, that this approach is really about removing the barriers. If we dismantle racism, everyone is freer, including the people who want to support these spectators who now also see more of the game. So this is about co-liberation. It is also about freedom for self, 
not about rescuing other people. We cannot see as much with this fence in our way. And we also cannot appreciate what the people we're trying to support are seeing when barriers like racism or sexism are in our way. So this is really about achieving equity um, and liberation. Okay, so back to the story. My great-grandfather learned English in Japan before coming to the United States. He quickly became a community leader, translating in the courts for fellow immigrants and assembling mutual aid societies to help struggling families with housing and business operations. He was a community organizer before it was cool, right? Before President Obama made it cool. Coming home from a society meeting one dark evening, he was shot in his driveway by a waiting assassin. We later learned that the murder was orchestrated by a band of men whom he was currently helping to prosecute for running an illegal gambling ring in the area. No one was ever charged or prosecuted for the crime. There was no investigation. The police looked the other way. My great grandmother's pleas fell on deaf ears. My grandfather Howard was 13, the oldest of five children at the time that his father was murdered. He was the one who discovered his father who was lifeless in his arms despite his efforts to revive him. This picture is a picture of the kerosene lantern that my grandfather held in his hand on that night, the lantern on the far left. This is in my, my um, aunt's barn today. My grandfather wrote in his memoirs that he knew in that moment that the weight of the world was on his shoulders. His mother did not speak English. His siblings were young and unable to help much with the farming. Howard had to rebuild his family's shattered life alone. He labored for the benefit of others, not himself, and he did that his entire life. He was a father to his siblings and a helper and a manager for his mother. He went to high school and ran the orchard operations as a teenager. He endured racism and anti-immigrant practices throughout these years, recalling to me decades later that, quote, no Japs allowed was common everywhere. Howard dropped out of college his second semester at UC Davis because he could not afford the $58 in tuition but he did make sure that every single one of his siblings graduated from college. So Coffee. this story uh, obviously is very deeply personal to me, but you'll notice that it's not that much different than what's currently happening in the world today. It's not that much different um, in terms of whose lives really matter um, and the ways that we need to stand up against injustice. So allies can play a role in fostering inclusion, affirming belonging, addressing harm, dismantling structural inequality, advocating for change. We can use our voices to speak up and our feet to stand up. And mainly allies listen and believe the stories that they're told. They want to know, they lean into discomfort. They weather the discomfort of, of the stories of others that might be very, very different than their own. So an ally, there's lots of words for it. I should say that I'm not in love with the word ally. I'm still searching. I think I've settled on co-liberator, um, but I've also heard co-conspirator, co-sponsor, partner, advocate, friend, good troublemaker, partners in good trouble. Lots of ways to describe how we bring ourselves to the cause, our full selves and genuine selves and work alongside others um, in order to make a better world. So this heuristic to really think about what motivates us um, toward allyship, what motivates us to make a better world, um, self-interest, altruism, um, or social justice. So in the first one, I think our motivation is really to protect. We see that there is something that's being done that's harming someone that we love. We want to address that direct harm. We want to separate, separate ourselves from the marginalized group. And so we really think the world is largely fair and it's individual acts, not necessarily systems that cause this. And it's a very hero rescuer mentality, right? I'm gonna put on my cape and I'm gonna do this work. Secondly is really altruism. When we become more aware of systems that disenfranchise people, we might be motivated by guilt or shame or apology. We might want to be seen as the exception to the norm. I identify with this group, but I'm not one of those people, right, that, that is under this negative stereotype about what people of my background or belief system have done. Um, this really looks at systems and not necessarily individuals and definitely sees other as the victim of oppression, not self. And so very often there's a lot of work to empower the group with self at the center. I will work with this community and give them money, but I wanna be a big part of it, right? 
And the third one is really Allies for Social Justice, which recognizes that this is about freedom for self and others from oppression. Our humanity is diminished when we allow racism to flourish. Our humanity is diminished when we allow racism to flourish. We have to recognize that there are losses to us in allowing these systems to um, continue. We hold ourselves accountable for change. We see the intersections of people and systems and we try to change both. Um, and it does require constantly revisiting our privilege um, and understanding that we in fact have a lens that might be different than the reality that someone else um, is sharing. So moving from I wanna help to I need to help you to in the end, I understand that I'm actually liberating myself. Uh, moving from you poor people to gosh, I really should help you to wow, we're in this together, right? This is my place in space as much as it's yours. Um, fixing and rescuing to working in partnership, right? The nothing about us without us partnership rule, not centering ourselves in the work, but taking time to listen and to ask. Um, doing a lot more listening than answering and making sure that we are acting um, authentically, that all these forms of oppression um, hurt our humanity and our being, um, not because we don't want people to think that we're politically incorrect um, or that we're a bigot. Back to the story. Uh, my great grandmother, by the way, um, wrote an autobiography. And when I was a kid, I didn't actually understand how extraordinary that was. Um, she micro published it before Shutterfly was a thing. And so I have this beautiful leather bound book that she wrote in Japanese that my aunt translated into English. Um, it's one of my most prized possessions. The book is called Recollections and this passage is directly from her book. Evacuation. In December of 1941, war erupted between Japan and the United States. For people of Japanese ancestry living on the West Coast, it became a time of uncertainty and a major uprooting for all established environment. In January of 1942, the federal government began evacuating all persons of Japanese ancestry, citizens and non-citizens alike, from what they considered defense sensitive zones. We were located on what was considered a non-strategic zone and were spared being sent to prisons where the internees were temporarily housed. However, by June, orders were out to evacuate all persons of Japanese ancestry from the West Coast. We had only seven days to prepare for our departure from the date of notice. This is the US War Authority Registry. These are the names of my family members, starting with Howard, going down to Miyoko. And this is the information that the government collected. You can look this up, it's public record. Um, this is the information that the government collected when they took my family's rights away. This is my grandfather's entry. They know whether he was married, who he was married to. Um, did he have an alien registration number? What was his religion? What were his skills? Um, had he ever been to Japan? Where did he live? This is my great grandmother's entry. Again, languages that she's speaking. Um, this to me says that we have to remain vigilant um, for, the, for the rights of others because our rights can also end up being taken away. And when I read this, it's very sobering because um, in my lifetime, you know, my, my grandfather did pass away, um, but he very well could be alive today. And there are people living today who remember having these experiences of being incarcerated um, because of their race. This is the history of the United States built on white supremacism, wherein we have cycled through various groups um, and have our very own brand, international brand of, of anti-Black racism that still flourishes. This is really why we need allies. This is more from um, my great grandmother's book. By the grace of God, Howard's closest friend was a school chum named Dan Mancibo. They were inseparable, having played, studied, and worked together. They shared many things in common, both with farming backgrounds, both having lost their fathers in their early teens and sharing the same kind of responsibilities. Dan is the only boy among five children and Howard is the oldest of five children. When the selective service system began to draft able young men into the service, Dan was declared ineligible in 1942 because of a knee injury sustained on the farm in his early youth. After leaving the farm, he took up arc welding and became a proficient welder at a shipbuilding facility in the San Francisco Bay Area. Because of the war, the United States had launched an extensive building program and welders were paid premium wages. 
Howard called Dan one night after the notice of evacuation was posted and told him about his plight and asked for assistance in finding someone to take over the farm during our absence for whatever the future held for the farm or the operator. Most tangible properties could be sold or given away, but to find a custodian for the improvement and land was a real problem. Dan replied that he would do whatever he could and come up to the ranch to discuss further. The next morning at the crack of dawn, Dan was at the ranch, but there was no discussion. He said, Howard, I brought my clothes with me. I intend to stay until your family returns, whenever that may be. You have much to do to get ready, so go on with it, and I'll take over the farm operations as of now. Is there a more explicit expression of friendship? The evacuation took place at a time when we were well into the harvest. So the, the pictures that you've been seeing on these slides are on the trees in my family's orchard. Because of Dan Mancibo, we did not lose our land. 75% of Japanese families along the coast did lose their land. Um, and we were one of the lucky ones that did not. Because of my grandfather's best friend who decided that he would give up premium wages as a welder and take care of 35 acres, 40 acres by himself um, during, during the war. Um, I am probably here today because of Dan Mancibo. I've never met this person. His actions made a huge difference in my life because my grandfather had a livelihood to return to and my dad was actually able to be born um, um, after the war. So uh, where does motivation for these actions come from? It comes from recognizing that uh, I am a product of kindness and, and allyship and people who remembered what their North Star was during times when it was difficult and really went against the norm. I really want to emphasize that social justice allies are made not born. As uh, Dean Cruz said, there's a lot of things that we often have to unlearn and that's hard and that's painful. We have to engage in awareness and uh, discomfort sometimes in, in the unlearning process. It requires confronting privilege which are things that we have that we don't earn. Um, and privilege doesn't make us bad, but it, it does make us responsible. And it does make us a steward of, of something that we have an obligation to use wisely. This requires us to think about what our blind spots are and to build skills um, to, to make interpersonal and structural interventions and to practice humility and also some shame resilience um, because there are going to be times if we want to do this work that we're gonna get it wrong. Um, Abby Wambach, who's a, you know, the amazing um, U.S. women's um, soccer players, has in her book, Wolfpack, a theory that when we come up against something where we fall short, we have a failure or something that goes against our values, we have three options. We can fall into a spiral of shame and decide that we're terrible and horrible and completely retreat from the whole thing. We can blame other people and say that it wasn't our fault, and we can look for external factors of uh, why this all happened, or we can decide that we want to claim it. And in claiming it, we claim also the power to change it. So as allies, I ask, what have you done with what you've received? How can you use your privilege to privilege others? You have to start where you are and stay centered in your intention without centering yourself. So thinking about what is the way forward right now? There are often multiple um, ways forward and multiple rights in these situations. I love, hate this photo and I'm sharing it. This is me um, when I was 17. This is Dr. Nakai version 17.0. I am now version 40.0. Um, this is me dressed as Pocahontas in high school. You can see that I was one of the only people of color in my high school in Utah. Um, I didn't know about cultural appropriation. I didn't know about indigenous genocide in the United States. I didn't know that it was disrespectful and hurtful to wear a costume like this. Um, when you know better, you do better. And that is the standard of an ally is as you learn and grow and expand your awareness, you do better and you change and you educate other people as much as you can and hold yourself newly accountable for the knowledge that you've gained. This uh, photo and, and reflecting on my journey as an ally and the things that I've had to unlearn uh, reminds me to keep doors open behind me, right? The level of hyperwokeism and judgment and harshness that we sometimes are tempted to apply isn't helpful in inviting others to this cause and asking for them um, to come in and get uncomfortable and grow. So in your journey, give space and grace for growth. 
So let's talk a little bit about some ally skills. We want to be specific and positive. We want to give space and ask for permission to have a conversation. There's gonna be sometimes some complexity and ambiguity in all of this. And we really wanna talk about impact um, and build empathy and ask for change. So this is just an example of a, a coaching script that um, a student and I discussed uh, in talking to a professor that the student really adored and just wanted to give this feedback to their professor um, because using this word really wasn't in keeping with how she knew the professor um, cared for students. It was just really outdated terminology and super unfortunate and needed to be addressed. And so asking to have a conversation and appreciating the efforts, um, giving some space. Are you ready to have this conversation? Would you be willing to have this conversation with me? This is a tough subject. This might get a little awkward, but I really want to give you this feedback because I care about our work together. Um, Using self as an example, you know, I'm still learning new terms. Terms are changing all the time. I recognize this can be overwhelming. Really the, I want our words to be heard and understood as we intend. Um, and so, and I've said that to colleagues before, I think the way that you said that wasn't consistent with what I know of you as an ally or what I know of you as a supporter of women or, you know, of minority patients, et cetera. And then ask for what you'd like instead. Um, this is kind of the example of um, here's what it sounds like, right? Uh, I have three teenagers. And so sometimes the little bit of attitude creeps in and I might say, you know, can you please empty the dishwasher before you go? And I get like a, uh, you know, eyes rolling or something and I'll pause and I'll say, here's what it sounds like. Sure, mom, I'd love to empty the dishwasher. I appreciate all the times that you usually do it. And this one time I would be really happy to help, right? So we have to give people sometimes words um, and specific things that they can do differently. So they also feel that they can walk away with um, ideas and suggestions for how to change. You definitely want to speak for yourself and from your own point of view. Um, very often we get a little bit tripped up because someone might say something that's really offensive, like let's say about a minority group. Um, and you might look around and wonder if that was offensive to people who you assume identify with that minority group who are in the room. Um, it's offensive to you, right? It doesn't matter if other people were offended by what was said. You can actually speak for yourself and for your own point of view, because remember, you're not here to rescue, you're here to liberate yourself, right? And you're here to maintain the humanity in the room. Um, a growth mindset is really important. I cannot tell you how many times I've fallen short um, or decided, oh, that was really clunky. I really wish I would have done something different, but I, I keep at it and I keep having conversations and keep reflecting on what I can do better. Um, and really start, if you're really new to this process, by noticing and naming. So just decide, you know, that you're going to notice more microaggressions or that you're going to notice how many times people, you know, don't engage in, in respectful pronoun practice or little things that some people might tell you, hey, I noticed this a lot. And you might think, oh, I don't really notice that, right? Or how many times women are interrupted in meetings, right? Start by noticing um, and then... You, you may be able to start naming and saying, oh, I'm seeing more of these dynamics because I'm training my brain to pay attention to these things that um, are being brought to my attention that I previously just haven't noticed because of my lived experience. So we can intervene, we can just name things, right? And in, in addressing microaggressions, which I almost don't like to call them microaggressions because they're called microaggressions because the people who are doing them intend them to be small, but very often they feel very big. <laughs> so we can just call them aggressions. Um, did you notice, right, how everyone moved their chairs or I'm seeing that XYZ is happening or why does the security guard ask you for identification or not me? Or isn't it interesting that she said this and people sort of bristled and thought it was aggressive, but when he said it, people accepted it as a good idea, right? So we can just um, make observations, very neutral statements that make observations that help everyone go, huh, I am noticing more of these things um, and encouraging us to address it in the moment and notice it and name it. Some ally phrases that you can put in your back pocket. I'm surprised to hear that from you. Um, depending on how you decide to identify or, or put um, an accent on the word, this can take on lots of different meanings, but perhaps it's a, it's a clinical situation and people say, you know what, forget about that, that patient's indigent, they're always coming, you know, there's just a big pain in the butt. Then you might say, wow, I'm really surprised to hear that from you. Maybe you're having a rough day, but I know that we're better than this right? Um, it's just a way of saying, normally, 
your behavior comes in here and today it's registering down here, hence the surprise. And it can help someone pause for a second and decide, do I wanna continue or do I want to do a little bit of a do-over? Second one, what did you mean by that? Asking people to explain a little bit more about what they mean, particularly if they're using coded language, um, can be helpful in identifying bias and helping to root it out. Um, so we were planning an alumni event at Northwestern and um, we were talking about the schedule and someone said, well, you know, we don't want to have those two events back to back because most of the physician wives, he's like, well, you know how women are. Um, and I said, well, what do you mean by that? And he was like, well, you know, like the, the time in between to get ready. And I was like, are you saying that the people who identify as men want to show up at the ball like sweaty and they don't care? And he's like, well, no, that's not what I'm saying. Right. So. We can just ask people to explain and then sometimes they will hear themselves saying something that actually is pretty laden with bias or wasn't fair or wasn't a true characteristic of what they mean. We can state our goals. Um, my goal here is for everyone to get good care. My goal is for us to communicate um, and just really talk about um, centering ourselves and our goals for being in the same room or for being together to try and diffuse the situation. If we have team rules, um, one of my favorite ones that Brene Brown always talks about is on my team, we talk to people, not about people. So to really encourage that direct communication. So if we have some team norms, we can pull those out and really say like, okay, back to team roles on our team. We get brave when things get awkward, right? Um, just saying I'm listening, right? I don't really understand this yet, but I'm, I'm listening and I'm willing to uh, work hard to understand this better. And then how can we work together on this? Um, maybe a decision is being made and, and you disagree with it, right? Like, we're just going to cut this budget. I don't think this is important. Um, it is important. I'd really like to work with you on this. Can we find a way to have a discussion um, so that I can share my perspective? What makes you think that or what makes you say that is helpful just to ask people to reflect on why are they drawing the conclusions that they're drawing. Um, we were planning a student event at Loyola one year and one of the people in the student council was like, well, um, if we're going to go to the south side, I can call my dad. He works for CPD and we can just get a police escort. And one of the other students was like, why would we need a police escort to go and, you know, deliver these, you know, supplies to this pantry on the south side? And she was like, oh, well, maybe, maybe we don't, right? So it's like this, little, it just explaining like a person's maybe thinking through a little bit more. Oh, maybe what I, what I said wasn't quite what I intended to say. Um, just stating that you're uncomfortable can be helpful. And just to help things pause for a minute, if a decision is being made or ideas are being thrown out, just to be able to say like, I'm uncomfortable right now. And the times that I've used this one, people have been like, oh, me too, right? And then it just sort of comes out and we sort of figure out how to step back and regroup um, and think about it. That's the second one is, can we just step back? Can I just get a pause? pause. Uh, let's just think this through. A pause can be really helpful in disrupting action bias or some other challenges that come up um, when we're in a very rushed situation. Um, another good one is to just check in on, on how you're hearing someone. This is what I heard you said is, say, is that what you intended? Um, so I was in a, a benefits session once and the person was talking about childcare and kept using like um, female pronouns and mom and only like, you know, insinuating that the people who would use these services were only women. So the person raised their hand and said, I'm hearing that these services are only for women and for moms. Is that what you're intending? And the person was like, oh no, they're for all parents, right? So she was really able to clarify, um, but it was helpful to be able to reflect back to this person delivering the message. This is what other people are hearing when you're saying something like that. And then reminding ourselves, hey, we're better than this, right? We can, we can do better um, and we can serve our patients better than this. We can take a minute um, and regroup and make a different decision. Um, sometimes you don't want to address it directly, and so you might just make an empathic comment. Um, you know, uh, I joined a gym when I first moved to Riverside, and there were there were there's a lot of unhoused folks, and Riverside housing is expensive, and we really struggle with um, affordable housing for everyone. So there were some folks sleeping in the building vestibules in front of the gym, and I walked in, and some of the women in the class were like you know, saying really rude things and, oh, the bums are back and, you know, just kind of making fun of people who are unhoused. And it really bothered me. But I was like, well, I have to work out here and I don't want to launch on my soapbox. And so I just looked at one of the women and I said, I can't imagine what it's like sleeping on the street. That must be terrible. I'm bringing granola bars and water tomorrow. I'll just leave it, you know, outside the gym door. And the woman's eyes got kind of big and she just looked at me. And that was my way of saying, like, I don't endorse um, this conversation or the way that you're seeing it. There's another way uh, of seeing this situation. 
Um, people might complain about, about residents. Oh, that resident is this or that. And you might disagree and you might say, yeah, being a trainee here is really tough. Or yeah, you know, med students have it rough these days, right? And just be able to offer something empathic um, to interrupt some of that uh, if you don't agree with it. Um, you can make a belief statement. Um, before marriage equality was a federal reality, um, I come from a very conservative family and I must have said, I believe all families deserve equality under the law like a billion times because that was just the end of every argument for me was this is just my position on it and that's what I believe and you know, I'm happy to hear the things that you believe but this is what, what I believe. Um, in, in the clinical setting, you know, I believe all expressions of pain should be taken seriously. I believe that all patients should be listened to, right? So some of these ways that we can just disrupt sometimes bias that's coming in various forms by stating what we believe. And sometimes you can just express disagreement and not debate. Um, it might be in a social situation where you're mingling. I've been in mixed company cocktail parties and people are saying really awful things about undocumented immigrants, which, uh, you know, I happen to work with a lot of undocumented student communities. And so I might just say, um, you know, as I'm mingling, um, you know, I'm going to go and grab some more, you know, canapes or whatever, but just, I'd like the record to reflect, I completely disagree with everything that you just said. And then I just can move on. So people who are bystanders will then register that, no, I didn't just tacitly agree and then let this person continue to say these things without being checked. And it's not an invitation to debate and it's not rude. It's just, wow, I have a completely different view on that. Maybe we can discuss it sometime. Reflective practice is another piece of ally skills that's, that's important to think about the opportunities to be an ally that you might have missed and to plan for next time. Gosh, what would I do differently? Um, and for those of us that teach, we probably have a million of these um, record stopping moments that have happened in the classroom where we've thought, oh, how could I prepare or do something different um, in the classroom? And planning ahead for these moments and, and thinking about them and taking time to recognize them as missed moments is also a really important part of our becoming um, because recognizing that there was an opportunity for improvement is, is a big step. Um, you can think about a time that you said or did something that, that didn't, you know, come out as you intended, and you can seek feedback from a, from a trusted source, particularly another person who's also on an ally journey that's similar to your own. Um, write your ally credo. What agreements are you willing to make with yourself about how to be an ally? Um, share these models with your colleagues and be a trusted person. If someone approaches you and says, hey, I want to discuss, you know, this thing that happened, um, you know, if you if you have uh, power and comfort in your identity or role, you can be a person who um, is a confidant to help others move through reflective practice. So we take responsibility um, for these spaces. Every context that we share is our place, right? We are radically responsible for belonging on campus. So it doesn't matter if it's not my lab, it doesn't matter if it's not my course, um, it's my campus, it's my community and um, acting is a way acting up and speaking out is a way of, of caring for self and for others. We want to work towards understanding and listening and asking, paying attention, making it our business to find out, um, intervening during or after. I found out that my daughter's middle school was um, disciplining students for wearing hoodies to school. And it was really upsetting. So I emailed the principal and I had a, and nothing happened to my daughter. And I don't really think she even wears hoodies, but I don't want my daughter to go to a school where children could potentially receive disciplinary action for something that they wear. And so I had a direct conversation with the principal. We talked about the dress code and the process and, um, you know, a little bit about school to prison pipeline and how, you know, how this policy was written. Um, and I, I think that you have to make it your business, right? I have to make it my business that this, the places and spaces where my children are educated, I want them to receive good and positive messages um, about their colleagues and the people that will be their colleagues down, down the road. We've talked about radical candor a little bit. Um, honest feedback is a gift. Um, and so that means being willing to endure discomfort in order to see uh, change in ourselves and in others. Uh, a lot of times standing in solidarity is really about listening um, and witnessing and validating. We can't always change the systems, but we can stand with people and we can believe them. Um, our positions as allies often grant us the privilege not to listen or to disbelieve or disregard rather than saying, if even one person was hurt by that, then I think that I, that I wanna hear about it. And I'd be willing you know, to listen and figure out what we can do differently next time. 
Honest feedback is also an invitation. So what you do with the truths entrusted to you will determine whether you are entrusted with future truths. You don't have to have all the answers. No allies do. I certainly don't. But you do have to be willing to listen. And you do have to be willing to recognize that, again, a, someone else's lens might not be the same as your own. Um, you can name these things and let people know that you are an ally. You can own aspects of your identity publicly so that people are aware that you are aware of what you're bringing um, into the room. So here's some examples of, of a concern, right? Security guards profile me. Typically, we might respond with something like, what? They're, they're so nice. Oh, Steve, he's a great guy. Wow, that's weird. Instead of thinking about, wow, this person's lens is really different from my own. I'm sorry to hear that. Tell me more about that and listen, right? Wow, your experience on campus is really different from mine. Tell me more about that. That sounds really difficult, right? Um, don't take it personally. Oh, he's like that for everybody. Oh, he's old school. He doesn't mean any harm, right? Well, that's unacceptable. It sounds hurtful. Look, is there anything I can do to address it, right? So we listen and we engage. Um, sometimes it shows up like this, right? I was body shamed by my attending. Oh, you're lucky because you're skinny. Right? That's centering ourselves at our own lens when someone else has shared something with us. Instead, I'm sorry to hear that. Tell me more about that. That's unfortunate, right? Um, my boss told me he's surprised I'm doing well because I'm from an HBCU. Really horrible microaggression. But isn't it great that he thinks that you're a strong performer? No, how about that sounds really hurtful. That's a racist comment, right? We can notice and name and witness and validate um, experiences that are different from our own. So I think it's important um, to think about that pivot to look at it through your lens. If there's a disconnect, get curious about it and listen instead. Most of us consider ourselves nice people. We would not wake up in the morning and say, yawn, good morning day, I am a racist, right? Like we don't think of ourselves in those terms. But niceness um, promotes status quo, which, which is steeped in the white supremacism of our country and promotes bias and bigotry and racist acts and racist attitudes because we can prioritize our own comfort over the cause. So niceness can serve as justification for inaction, right? For not holding people accountable and can allow systems of oppression to be upheld and maintained. Um, I did put in the chat that the AMA did not apologize for excluding black physicians until 2008. Um, the AMA also stood idly by as physician colleagues were arrested in 1967 at an AMA conference that was held in the South in an all white dining room. And their response was, we can't do anything about the law of the land, right? We're not the ones arresting these colleagues. We just sat idly by as nice people while our physician colleagues were disrespected and arrested at a professional meeting. I cannot even imagine. But niceness, right? I'm not the person doing it. It may not be your fault, but it's your responsibility, right? And again, your humanity, a portion of the humanity of all of those physicians in the room was degraded when their colleagues were not allowed to stay. Right? So racism and all forms of oppression, again, not our fault, but it is our responsibility. We are the current beneficiaries and operatives of the system. And so it's our obligation um, to step in and to do what we can. So immediate actions for allies. Express your support for DEI to everyone that you supervise and lead. Make your, um, your views known. Add this to your missions and express your core values. Ask to have challenges brought to your attention. I will very often tell students, um, if this isn't right or that's not right, I'm your first stop. If someone comes and talks to me and they report something and then we use our equity process, I will also tell them if there's even any whiff of something that you think is, is a negative consequence of this, I'm, I'm your first phone call, I'm your first door, right? Ask to have those challenges brought to your attention. Offer solidarity to colleagues who are uh, who are stepping up and addressing those challenges, right? Offer to volunteer, join a committee, or be part of the work. Seek your own resources for allied development. There are a, a million amazing books, not enough time to read all of the wonderful books. Um, two of them that I'm um, just read are um, The Sum of Us by Heather McGee and How the Word is Passed by Clint Smith, and I recommend both of those as important um, history in the United States of discrimination and the way that racism hurts everyone. Um, and then again, becoming uh, involved in different platforms and existing structures at your institution. And if you don't have them, build them and fund them and fund them well, um, because this is really everyone's work. Advocate for values to be added to materials. So look at your materials and, and say like, is this, 
you know, if we were, didn't know us and we were looking from the outside in at our institution, are these things true? Um, collect our data on climate representation, mistreatment and harassment at our institution, investigate policies and procedures, and make sure that you know how to address these challenges. Very often when DEI challenges come up, we're really caught on our heels because again, it's not our lens or lived experience that these things are going to happen. So at my university, our policy is we have this standard, you know, we don't discriminate and blah, blah, blah. And the second part of it is when racism shows up, when discrimination shows up, this is what we do. This is what we are prepared to do. If you would want to join this community, you agree to participate in this collective process that we expect for everyone um, when called upon uh, to engage in. And this is how we address you know, mistreatment and these types of concerns within our um, institutions. And then if you control resources, allocate them accordingly. Support your SNMA chapter, support your first gen student group, support your Asian American student group, um, and advocate for resources um, that go toward anti-racism. Challenge expressions that are inconsistent with your ally identity and co-liberate. Um, practice giving and receiving radical candor, which is, which is tough. Practice listening. Um, choose to model a, a different pathway. Promote systemic changes. Vote with your dollars when you can. Um, there's a very long list of businesses that are on our family's boycott list because they didn't make the human rights campaigns equitable um, you know, business practices. And, and it's one thing that we can all do is try and vote with our dollars and support companies um, that, that support our values. Um, be engaged, vote your, your ally values and focus on incremental change because these things are not going to be changed overnight. Um, broaden our definitions and continue to learn. Acknowledge our privilege. Um, even the privilege that I have as a speaker to, to be very vulnerable and to share um, things around my past, uh, I recognize in, in some ways are part of the social identities that, that I carry. Uh, we can educate ourselves and again, focus on impact over intentions. Very often it's, well, you know, we shouldn't hold them accountable because they didn't mean to be hurtful. If it was hurtful, then there needs to be some restorative justice and, and some repair attempts that are focused on addressing that harm and that mitigate some of the trauma that can come when we bump into each other in these ways. And listen and accept uh, truth when it's entrusted to you. Uh, learn to listen, especially if you, it's from someone with a very different lens or who's having a very different experience than your own. So um, our last question for reflection is, what is one commitment that you can make right now to further your ally journey? And um, hopefully you, if you would like to share something now, it's free text, you can type something in. Um, and in our forum tomorrow, we'll also have an opportunity to talk a little bit more about these skills and to grapple a little bit with anything that stood out, um, stood out to you. So do you have any suggestions? Okay, listen, very good. Be open to listen if I make a mistake, yeah. Mistakes are painful. And I've made plenty of them and I'm, I'm better for every single one of them that I make, right? Never make the same mistake twice, that's the rule. Learn, um, share tips with your organization, commit to learning, be empathetic, offer mercy, report more, mm -hmm. notice, pay attention, own responsibility for our own humanity, absolutely. Speak up when you witness aggressions, don't be afraid to apologize, that's a big one. I've put my foot in my mouth so many times and just had to say, can I just go back and address this thing? It didn't come out as I wanted, right? Be conscious of how words can be perceived. Speak up even if it's a joke, absolutely. Support others more, respond with knowledge. Yeah, these are, these are really great. Get to know better and do better. Yep, continue learning and growing. Be more aware of what I say. Don't be afraid to do your own research. Absolutely. There is so much learning to be done on our own. Great tools, podcasts, books, documentaries. Um, there's a wonderful Black Lives Matter collection on Netflix right now with a lot of really great um, films that I think are really eye-opening and that uh, would, be, would be really good things to watch. Work on not being nice. Yeah. Um, nice can, can be tyrannical, right? Um, kind is better. And kind and honest really go hand in hand, kind and honest and authentic. Um, and, and really, the people who care about us the most are the ones who are going to tell us and give us the feedback when we're not coming across as our values intent. Put down my phone. Yeah, notice what's going, around us, going on around us a little bit more. Look into ways we can help. Ask for honest feedback. Yeah, and that's a hard one too, um, as a 
as a leader, being able to ask the team, you know, what are some things that I'm really doing well? And what are, what are some things that I could work on? Or how, what are some ways that I can support you better? Absolutely. Um, okay, so I wanna close with uh, a final paragraph from my great grandmother's book. This chapter is called Return Home. Our final journey home was made a few months later in October. This is three years after. So they were in prison for three years. It was a journey of many emotions. Our arrival at our farm was certainly not with fanfare and music, but one of quiet entry. There was no one there for Dan had vacated the farmhouse in anticipation of our return that morning. But it was more than simple anticipation for though there were no bands playing, it was truly a warm welcome home. The yard was cleaned, the house was immaculate, the appliances were there as we left them, and upon entering the refrigerator, upon opening the refrigerator door, a tear-jerking discovery was made. There waiting for our first meal were eggs, fresh milk, bread, and jelly. Across the way in the chicken coop were five or six laying hens with enough feed for the immediate future. Dan and his mother had made us this careful preparation, not with words, but with deeds to let us know we were welcomed back to this heretofore forbidden land. Indeed, I was touched and humbled as tears welled in my eyes. I had seen again a demonstration of love. I really cannot express to you um, how grateful I am to be able to share um, a little bit of my family's story today. And I hope that you can see the deep um, and abiding passion I have for speaking up um, because I am the product and the recipient of, of people who did the right thing for the right reason um, in that moment. There was no reason for people to help my grandfather. Um, it was friendship and kindness and connection across difference um, that enabled my family to survive. This is um, the driveway looking down out to the road of, of Highway 193 um, in Newcastle, California. So the house is behind and you're looking down on, on the farm. So thank you so much. Um, and I, I wish you the best in your ally journey. I wish you as much discomfort that you need for your growth um, and a, a lot of new learnings and new openings and, and opportunities. And this is uh, just a little last picture of the monument. These are my three children. This is the monument to Tomeo and Yoshichi Kanakai who founded the orchard in 1912. Um, and I'm, this is the legacy that I hope to, to leave um, my children, service, justice, kindness, and love. Well, Dr. Nakai, thank you so much for this amazing presentation and for providing us with um, so many skills um, as we're on the journey. Uh, to be better allies. Uh, one of the things that we said is that this lectureship has really given us an opportunity to illuminate some of our blind spots. Um, tomorrow, we hope that you all join us from 9 to 11 um, for our forum. I've put in the chat the meeting ID and also the passcode. Uh, and once again, uh, Dr. Uh, Lockhart will be facilitating that, but Dr. Sunny Nakai will also be there so that we can continue to uh, dive deeper into some of the material that she has provided for us. I wanna congratulate our Kenny Brew Trailblazer Equity Award winners, Mr. Blackwell and the Student National Medical Association. And also want to thank our partners uh, with uh, HSHS and also with Memorial Health for helping us to bring this to our community. So thank you and you all have a good night. Dr. Alameen. Uh, so did the P4 students have to join from 9 to 11? You all will be in school tomorrow, so no. <laughs> Those are for our community. We're really happy that you all were able to be here tonight and we'll Thank talk you. about this material some more tomorrow. All right, so uh, our, we have to join tomorrow at four, right? Right, four o'clock. Thank you. You're welcome.